Oh, God is good. If it's your first time in church, bless you. Um, it can be a bit weird, I know. Um, it gets less weird the more you know about it. <laughs> uh, and everything has a reason. And, and we're currently in a season of uh, looking for truth where we're uh, exploring all these things that we do as Christians and, and the things we have uh, and trying to find the, the, the truth behind them because we don't want to just do things for the sake of doing them, right? Uh, we we want to understand them and know why we do them, especially those things that can sometimes look a bit weird to everybody else. So if you're wondering why we sing, well, we've done a preach on it. Uh, if you want to know why we gather here on a Sunday, Mark's done a preach on it. Uh, and you find all that stuff on our YouTube channel to catch up. And so if you're like, why have they done that? It's proper weird. Um, there's usually a really good explanation for it. <laughs> and so we're hopefully going through that stuff. And so if you're like, that bread and wine thing was very weird, guess who's preaching on it next week? Hallelujah, Mark. And so don't miss out on that because it'll explain to you why we do uh, what we do. And so it's really good to see you again this morning. For those of you who don't know, my name's Harry. I am the minister here at the Wild Church, a part of the wider serving team. Um, and today we are continuing our mini-series in our series, Looking for Truth, looking at the Ten uh, Commandments. We uh, had a quick overview of the whole commandments, uh, why these rules are not meant to bind us, but they're actually there to free us and how they're meant to protect us from the things that would steal, kill, and destroy us. Last week, we looked at the first commandment and what it means to have no other gods before Yahweh and how no god is his equal. Specifically, we looked at how modern uh, pseudo-spirituality wants to sneak in and steal from you. Things like tarot cards, Buddhist meditations, horoscopes, all of that sort of stuff. And in this regard, it is our job to keep our hands and our hearts clean. And today we're going to be uh, looking at the second commandment, which is much longer than the first one, um, and is a little bit more complicated and brings things that we need to be aware of. Um, but as always, let me just quickly pray, and then we'll read the text together. Lord, I ask that you speak today. Nobody wants to hear from Harry but we want to hear from heaven's heart. So Holy Spirit, will you do the talking? We need you. We need to hear you. Speak to us. Amen. And so we're still in Exodus. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth, beneath, in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. This text deals with a lot, um, and so I want to break it down for you to make it a bit more manageable and an understandable thing. And so the three ways that I'm going to break this down, if you're taking notes, is, is the first part is the commandment itself, uh, the second part is the why and a description of Yahweh, who is God. Yahweh, by the way, is the Hebrew name for God. Uh, and then the actions of Yahweh. What does Yahweh do? And so let us deal with the first part, the commandment itself. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And so I know a bunch of you are suddenly really worried because you've got Robert Powell on your walls. Uh, if you don't know, he's the original OG Jesus Christ in uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, <laughs> but, but actually, don't worry, that's not the uh, images and the idols that God's referring to in this commandment. And so first, that's what I want us to look at. What is an idol, an image made in the form of God uh, and, and it's designed to uh, function as a localized place of worship for that deity. Here we have a couple of examples. Um, firstly, what one of these like uh, graven images might look like in the ancient Near East. Uh, so the first one is an idol that's found in Beth, Bethsaida. I always butcher that name. Uh, uh, there, there we've got an idol from a Roman cult in the middle. Uh, the, the, the drawing is what an idol would have looked like for Diana of Ephesus. Um, on the right, you can buy that one on Amazon um, uh, for all the Hindu gods. I'm not recommending it. Don't do it. 
Uh, and, and then all of you guys would probably at some point send the little Buddhas that people have in their houses and their gardens and those sort of things. That is an idol, something made in the image of a deity in the idea of having localized places of worship. And so in the ancient Near East, um, people would carve and craft these idols from uh, stone and from wood. Uh, and they believed that the idol itself actually manifested the presence of their God. And so there was this immediate sense that there was a local divinity being placed in. Um, for example, the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians uh, would have opening of the mouth ceremonies uh, where they would give birth to one of these statues, the fake giving birth to one of these statues, uh, for it to be a new manifestation of the physical presence of the God they were worshipping, the invisible becoming visible for them. That's what they would do. And so this is what we're talking about. So when, when uh, God says you shall not make an image, we're not talking Robert Powell. We're talking about this sort of stuff, these uh, deeply religious, false God stuff. Does that make sense? When him. And so with the localized presence of their God now installed, uh, they believed they could effectively worship and manipulate that God by doing certain offerings and certain things. Worshippers of Baal would hurt themselves and and different people would sacrifice their children, uh, and there'd be loads of different stuff that they would do. Uh, the the uh, Just checking all the kids actually went downstairs. They did. The, the goddesses of sex and stuff, they would have orgies in the presence of it, all in the sense of trying to manipulate their God to doing what they wanted. This is the reality, and we shouldn't ignore it. And so they would stick it in the place and say, hey, this now helps us make God, this God, not Yahweh, fake gods, serve the purposes of man. And this is why Yahweh says, hey, don't do this. Last week, we looked at how Yahweh was the only God, right? There was no other gods beside him. There's nobody that comes close to him. You can't put anybody near him. And so if we know that God is the only God, how mental is it if we think that we could capture and contain him in the thing of a stone that we've cut? His power and his magnificence, his infinite wisdom and knowledge, his, his might. If as if we could put that into a bit of wood because we carved a nice picture upon it. How mad to think that we could do such a thing. And to do so as a Christian or then as a Hebrew person receiving the Ten Commandments would in itself constitute blasphemy because you are reducing God from his infinite wonder and majesty to something that's tiny and finite and man-made. Does that make sense? That's why you always don't. Don't do that. It's really silly and stupid. Yeah? And so Yahweh tells his people, I am the only God. You cannot capture me. You cannot contain me. And don't go around pretending that you can. Don't go showing me off like some trinket on your necklace. Hey, look what we can do, hey, if you do this, you can make Yahweh jump and dance. By the way, if you didn't know, God is not a magic genie in the lamp and you can't rub him the right way to make miracles appear the way you want them to appear, right? He is the one that's in charge. We are the created. He is the creator. Uh, but this really does uh, move us into the second part of this scripture. It reveals to us the heart and the character of Yahweh and his motivations. Let's look at the scriptures again. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, if, you're, if you're here for the first time today, uh, a lot of Christians would like, be like trying to emphasize that Jesus is love. He is, absolutely. Uh, but I think one of the biggest mistakes we've made as a wider church and one of the biggest sins that we have going on and on and on is that we try to create God in our image and what we think he should be like. One of the things that is happening so much right now in progressive Christianity is this idea that we can only view Jesus and God through the lens of compassion and social justice. And don't get me wrong, God is compassionate, merciful, and just. But if it's the only way we view him, we miss out on this big image of God. If we confine Jesus to a lens of, uh, 
lens of compassion, I think we are crafting and confining him to our modern image of ethical righteousness. And that's a dangerous thing for us to do. Because we see right here that God defines himself as a jealous God. Wow, right? That's a bit like, whoa, what's going on there? You with me? Because surely jealousy is a negative thing. Not to be overly gobby, but maybe we shouldn't impose our thoughts of what what jealousy is on God. Maybe we should shift our perspective to him rather than trying to make him shift to our perspective of what is right and is wrong. We shouldn't try and confine him to our boxes. boxes. Maybe we should move to a place of better understanding of who God says he is. Who am I to say to God, you cannot be this way because I don't like it? Who am I to say, this is the way I think you should be? And what is amazing about this scripture is that God identifies as a jealous God, which reveals two things to us. Firstly, this will shock all you religious guys. There's, there's such a thing as holy jealousy. Wow. Wow, there's such a thing as holy jealousy. Because God, by his very nature, is the barometer of all things that are good. And so if he does it, it is good. And so if he self-identifies as a jealous God, therefore the jealousy that he experiences is not sinful or wrong. It is good because he's God. You with me? I feel like I said a lot of G's then. But you with me? Because he is the one that decides what's good. He is the plumb line that the rest of the creation goes off. And so if he says, I am this, well, that is good. Because by his very nature, he is good. And what's interesting here is as we read the commandments later on, when it starts talking about uh, don't covet your wife's neighbor and all that sort of stuff, it's the other way around, uh, your neighbor's wife uh, and all that sort of stuff. It says covet, not jealousy. In the same bunch of scriptures, it uses a different word. Why? Because I think God is trying to explain to us here that the jealousy he is on about is not the covetness that he condemns in a little while. His jealousy isn't for his neighbor's wife or for something he doesn't have. His jealousy is for something that is rightfully his in the first place, his people, his worship, his honor. He is jealous for the things that belong to him, not other people's things. He's not saying I want their thing. He's saying I want the thing that belongs to me. Does that make sense? I am the Lord your God, a jealous God. See, this commandment reveals to us also what Yahweh does and how he reacts to people when the relationship is broke. And again, we try to avoid some of this stuff. Uh, Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so again, we see clearly here that God, the real image of God, is not the thing that everybody tries to portray sometimes as Jesus just being your best friend. It's not all sunshine and roses. He is holy and set apart and jealous. And he despises those who reject and hate him. And for those people, there is no blessing. A consequence of worshipping false gods and and man-made things. There's a removal of blessing and protection. There is an allowing of hurt and punishment. And from our post-New Testament knowledge, a place where there is gnashing of teeth and lots of tears. There is a place that is separated from God, a place of eternal conscious punishment. But for those who love him, there is blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And the blessing is so mighty It exceeds the individual and goes for a thousand generations. His jealousy doesn't just bring about punishment, but it brings blessing and blessing and blessing and blessing. There is something that we have lost, something precious and and mighty, you know, something that we don't like to talk about. And, and I sort of think we shy away from it because we desperately want to be humble people. But the reality is, my life is better than anybody who doesn't have God in their lives. My life is better 
than anybody who doesn't have God in their lives. And my life isn't perfect. That's not what I'm saying. Yesterday, I was in Pinnafields all day. You know, my life isn't perfect. It's not great. It doesn't always go the way I plan. But my life is better with God in it than anybody else's life who doesn't have God in it. And we shouldn't shy away from that. We shouldn't pretend like that's not true. It is better to know Jesus than to not know Jesus. It is better to have his manifest presence in your life than to not. It is better to be surrounded by him. It's better to be in a community of believers who love him. It's better. It is better. It is better. And we shouldn't pretend it's not. False humility isn't going to change anybody's minds. The reality is my life is better than yours if you don't have Jesus in it. That's a good thing mainly because he's also available for you to have. He's not mine to hide and store away. He's available to everyone. And he is jealous for me. Wow. He's jealous for my worship. Let me say that to you. He is jealous for you. He is jealous for your worship. When you give your mind and your heart to things that are false and fake, he is jealous for you. He loves you. He wants you. He wants your attention. He wants your mind to be on him. He wants to be in a deep and intimate relationship with you. He is jealous for you. And that jealousy is such a great compassion and and grace and unbelievable mercy. And through the prophet Hosea, we see a story that demonstrates God's love for you. What happened between you and God? See, Hosea is a guy who marries a prostitute and she's uh, had a bad place, but he marries her. They come together, they join. Despite her past, they come together. But Hosea's wife goes back into prostitution. She goes back into her sin and her shame. He's, he's, he's hers and she, he is his. And they're bound together in matrimony, loving one another. And she goes back into sin. She goes back into shame, into mess, into prostitution, into this chaos. But this is what God says to Hosea. Go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cake. It's amazing, absolutely amazing story because Hosea on the word of the Lord goes and gathers the money he has and gathers the stuff. He goes to the messy place where she is at and he buys back his wife. Man, could you imagine? The one who's meant to be with you anyway, the one who's meant to love you and be close to you, you're having to go back to her pimp and pay off to get her back. Man, that is crazy. But the Lord says this, this is my relationship with the Israelites, with mankind, with humankind. This is what we have done. And just like Hosea, God has sent Jesus, his son, to come and pay a heavy price, a high price. As he stands on the cross and he dies for you, he pays that price to redeem you back to himself because he is jealous of you. He's jealous of your worship. He wants it for himself so much as his love for you, he sends Jesus to die. His jealousy is a good thing, not a bad thing. Because he pays that price to invite you into a personal, deep relationship with him. And if you don't have that relationship and you want that relationship, come speak to me. I'd love to talk you through it. If you're watching this online, then I'd love to help you through it. Send me a message. You know, there is no greater thing In my life, and I have a wonderful wife and child, there is no greater thing than the redeeming love of Christ. It is my most precious thing. And I'd love to share that with you. And so he wants a relationship that allows you to fulfill your original purpose in life. The thing in which you were created to be and the things that you were created to do. Free from the entrapment of sin and shame, protected from the enemy and his plans to take your part and place in his church, the bride of Christ, and to give him worship and adoration. See, man cannot create God 
We cannot capture his image. We cannot craft a few stones and, and entrap God into them. But I don't know about you. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But I've heard about the image of God before in the scriptures. And I wonder if we pause and think on it, what this would say to us. See, Genesis tells us something remarkable right at the beginning. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. What? Wait, what? God took Adam out of the earth and crafted us, took Eve out of Adam and crafted us in his own image image. You here today sit as the image of God. God created and placed his image in the garden at Eden. Wow. And then if we fast forward just a little bit into the New Testament, we understand that we in his image are being made clean and pure through his death and his resurrection and find new life. And we read this, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Let me read that again. Do you not know that your bodies, these are the people that have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are no longer your own. You were bought at a price. Wow. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We are designed to live lives that host the Holy Spirit God himself. So in this world, we are purposed to be the place of his manifest presence so that every step we take through life, we are bringing the kingdom of God here on earth. We exist to share the, new, the good news of Jesus Christ's gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. Divinity and humanity joined together because Christ was jealous and came for you. And so if you are redeemed today by Christ Jesus, then you are in his image, a place of his holy dwelling, not to receive his worship, but to be a filter and a funnel for his worship, to pass it on to him by following his commands and loving him with all your mind, body, heart, and strength, and by loving your neighbor as yourself. We cannot contain or create God. For God in his infinite might and wisdom and love has turned you into a temple of the Holy Spirit. And as such, you are therefore charged to live lives worthy of the calling. 